Hey folks, it's Jim. Hi Jim, how are you? Hey Jim. Very good. Hey Raul. Hello. Uh, hello. We'll give folks a few more minutes to join and then we can get started. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Rahul. How's everyone? Hey, Robert. Hey, Robert. I see the meeting link is a popular destination here yeah the um by the way robert any updates from christoph on getting the zoom link and all of those things transferred uh you know i hadn't seen anything but uh while we're waiting another 30 seconds or so i'll, I'll just double check the, the pr okay i know i saw that you posted your uh Linux Foundation requirements. So thank you. I think that was the only thing that was blocking, but. Okay. I see a couple of the usual suspects, but I don't see everybody. We're getting a couple more to join. Well, why don't we kick it off, Jim? Sounds good to me. All right, hi everyone. This is Jim Baguadia, and we are kicking off our working group meeting for June 9th. So welcome, and we have quite a few topics on the agenda, so we'll dive right into it. I think the first topic, um, thank you, Rahul. Uh, Rahul from Akinox is joining us to do a presentation on Kube Armor. And there's a link to the presentation in the doc. So I'll stop my screen share and hand it off to Rahul. Thank you, Jim. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to present to this wonderful community. Uh, I hope I'm sharing my right screen. Uh, See a PowerPoint. Thank yes. you. Oh, fantastic. All right. Uh, so uh, let, me, let me start my video. So I'm going to talk about uh, Cube Armor, but uh, you know, just before going into Cube Armor, a quick introduction about you know, myself and Akinox. So uh, you know, at Akinox, we have been working on container runtime security, so network policy enforcement, system policy enforcement, and data policy enforcement uh, put together is what we are working on: so 360 degree runtime security controls. And Cube Armor comes in the context of uh, systems policy enforcement. So how, uh, I, I know there is already a lot of work done in the context. I would like to uh, you know, uh, emphasize about what the problem statement is, what, as, as we see it, uh, what the solution, what is the possible solution that we are working towards and some of the future uh, work items that we have on, uh, on our roadmap. 
Okay, so the problem statement here is uh, we have several alerting engines when it comes to systems policy controls, uh, but Cube Armor is the first uh, uh, systems policy enforcement control. I know that there are few uh, organizations out there who do policy enforcement as well, but none of that is available in open source. So we decided to uh, keep this project in open source so that uh, we can get all the feedback that we can possibly from the DevOps, DevSecOps community. Uh, the next, uh, the the point, uh, the primary problem statement that we came across with system policy enforcement is that you know it's it's extremely difficult getting SLNX app armors deployed, and even if you get it deployed, if you have to make any changes at a later point of time, it's extremely difficult. It's extremely hard. You're, there's a lot more chances that you'll get it wrong, and the impact not only has on that particular container, but it has a, the impact could be on the overall host. So it's, 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 it's pretty tricky. Most of the times what we have seen is SLNX and uh, the LSMs in general getting disabled uh, on, the, on the platform. The second point here is that we want to emphasize that you know, container runtime security is not just equal to network security. That is what uh, more or less the formula equals today. Uh, and I would like to you know, uh, present an example of what the way we see it in, in, in the context of existing compliance frameworks and the defense, fr defense frameworks. The third aspect, the, uh, even though there are LSM primitives which can do such kind of policy controls, these policy controls are not uh, tailored towards Kubernetes uh, as a platform. So what does Cube Armor does in the context is what uh, I'd be speaking. And the runtime security for systems and applications, I guess I've already mentioned that it's vital for compliance and hardening standards. Uh, let me quickly jump into some existing solution. We know Falco and Tracy already exist. And Falco and Tracy does a wonderful job about integrating the eBPF backend and coupling it with the Kubernetes metadata to provide a flexible uh, rules engine with, with all the alertings that is possible. And in fact, Falco has this rich uh, uh, YAML policies predefined, which can, which can target several C, uh, CV exploits and certain defense frameworks such as MITRE. Uh, but both of these are not enforcement engines, and that is where we are heading towards with, uh, with respect to QR. Quickly, you know, uh, from the MITRE attack framework, what I wanted to depict from this particular slide is that when it comes to network versus systems based attacks techniques, uh, this is the snapshot from MITRE. What we see here is that there are a lot of, lot of defense techniques which are, which are specifically in the context of net systems policies than network policies. Yes, of course, the network policies have an important play, uh, role to play that, you know, if, 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 uh, deployment or platform is configured properly without with the best network policies you might you may you will be able to prevent the attacker coming into the coming into your network but if you assume that the attacker is already in your network what you need is you know how how do you prevent the lateral uh, la lateral movement and how do you make sure that your existing systems are hardened enough such that none of the uh, you know none of the data exploits or uh, uh, data exfiltration can happen. So that's where systems based policies comes into picture. And you know what we have done is we have tried to go through all the MITRE based uh, uh, defense uh, uh, primitives that are mentioned in the uh, MITRE attack framework. We try to check if we can map it to cube armor policies. Now, we're not only depending upon, uh, so, so alerting is of course important, but in some cases, the rules are so straightforward that blocking it makes more sense. Uh, for example, deleting the system's binary files in a predefined place. If someone tries to delete some some binary, it, it's better to lock it than to simply give an alert. And I'll tell uh, locking is uh, or preventing or blocking an access in context to Falco or Tracy is possible. I'll try to explain in the uh, subsequent slides how Cube Armor will be different in that. Context. But before going there, some of the challenges with respect to systems primitives and uh, you know uh, uh, that, that we faced. Now, the best primitive out there available for uh, systems policy enforcement is, of course, LSMs. I, I guess there is there is absolutely no doubt about it, and there are several LSMs available: App Armor, SLNX, Mac, Tomoe, and so on. Uh, there is a new breed of LSM that is uh, coming up uh, in the form of BPF LSM, essentially KRSI, Kernel Runtime Security Instrumentation, which allows one to insert eBPF bytecode at LSM hooks. Uh, we are very excited about this particular development, and this is something that we uh, that we are looking forward to get merged into Q uh, get utilized in Cube Armor as soon as possible. 
the biggest advantage of Linux uh, security modules or LSMs are that they do not suffer from talk down or time to check or time to, time to use problem. Uh, it's not an asynchronous enforcement. It is inline enforcement. I've got a slide uh, which, which talks about it. Uh, but the problems are these, uh, these primitives are not integrated with Kubernetes or Docker uh, container platforms. The, the learning curve for these policy languages is extremely steep. Uh, it's, 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 it's very easy to get it wrong. Uh, uh, if someone uh, a novice or uh, tries to uh, tries to attempt uh, tries to tries an attempt to you know, specify this policy, and and then the bigger problem is that every LSM even within App Armor there is version one, two, and three, and depending upon your platform you might have version one, two, and three, and the behavior differs drastically. What kind of system policies that can be enforced differs drastically, so it's all sorts of complexity. Uh, with Cube Armor where we the, the, the aim is that we try to we, we try to hide this complexity behind the declarative language of YAMLs and make sure that the user can specify YAMLs as the policy and internally cube armor will ensure that the right primitive is used for system policy enforcement, be it app armor, SLNX, depending upon the platform that you're using, or BPF LSM in the future, or both. Uh, BPF LSM is a stackable LSM, which means that it can work with App Armor and SE Linux. Uh, so, so there, there, there is a chance of using either or and as well uh, in, in this case. Then there are other primitives available. Of course, sec seccomp is available, but but uh, you know the seccomp the primary problem is that it's a one-way transition to restricted state. Once you you know it, the dynamic changes once the container starts, it's not possible. So you have to enforce all the primitives that you want during the start of the containers. Uh, uh, this is the primary reason why it has limited adoption till date. And then, of course, the user space controls, which I won't uh, we'll go into the details. LD preload, it's, it's a very, you know, it doesn't even come into the same strata, but I've seen this mentioned in a in, in couple of calls before. Uh, so, so that's why I put it up here. Uh, you know, it's, it's basically application based. Uh, uh, you can override, you can hook to the library calls, not the system calls, the library calls like glibc, any dynamic library call can be hooked up using, uh, uh, you can be preloaded using LD preload and you can override that li library call. Uh, it has, uh, it itself has a lot of problems. An attacker can easily bypass a library call and directly invoke a system call. Just, just let, let, this is just one of the basic problems that is with LD preload. So uh, I talked about asynchronous control versus inline control. Now with Falco and Tracy, it is possible to get an alert if something goes wrong or if a rule fires. The, the only way to do some enforcement is that the alert is sent, there is an audit alert handler, and then there is a policy engine which says that if I see something like this, you can, you can kill the malicious process uh, and then you, know, you, you block the attack. But the problem is by the time this, uh, this is an asynchronous handling, which means that the malicious process might have done the damage already. So that, that's a problem with asynchronous control versus LSMs allows you to have inline control. That's, that's the basic property of LSM, which means that you can, uh, you can specify the policy engine before the access is done, which means that if you want to block, block the access, if you want to block the unlink, if you want to block any specific uh, object, you can do it in line, uh, which is the best way of uh, doing any policy control or policy enforcement. So uh, the, the the aim of Cube Armor is that you know we, we are, what we are trying to do in the context is uh, we are trying to build a Kubernetes native solution. Essentially, the way we see it is uh, as you know Cube Armor is an operator for LSMs. Uh, what we do, with eBPF, what we are trying to do today is that. Once there is an audit event generated, that audit event has to be coupled with Kubernetes metadata so that the alerting engine can make use of it and uh, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the telemetry engine can uh, further benefit from it. So the eBPF is primarily used today for correlating the audit event with the actual Kubernetes metadata. KRSI is something that we, we we are working towards now, which will allow the but KRSI is available only from kernel version 5.8 and above, and uh, uh, it's still yet, we, we are yet to see that kernel in production environment. Uh, but but we, we are hoping that in another year or so it will be ubiquitous, and we are hoping to make use of uh, KRSI as the primary point of policy control policy enforcement. 
so so uh, this is the high level view of what cube armor does what are the key design elements of cube armor one is that it, it, it it's of course a kubernetes native engine which is it's it's a kubernetes operator for system wide security policies you specify a yaml policy as an input internally cube armor will make will check what is the best lsm to use what is the best primitive to use in the context of linux kernel and use that primitive to enforce that yaml policy specification internally it will convert that yaml into app armor possibly or it might convert it into sc linux depending upon the platform used uh, ebpf engine like i mentioned before is to couple audit information with audit alerts uh, with the kubernetes metadata so it handles lsm deployment complexity like here i've mentioned you know the app armor there is version one two and three and even in case of sc linux there are several versions which has very different uh, uh very different policy language very different app armor and sc linux by themselves are completely you know they, they are very different in terms of how they enforce policies we don't expect an administrator a kubernetes administrator to understand app armor and sc linux and also you can see that by default gk a container optimized OS ships with app armor versus eks amazon linux 2 ships with sl linux by default amazon 2 linux amazon doesn't have a predefined image which supports app armor which makes it even difficult because an administrator is expected to know both app armor as well as sl linux which is which is which is very difficult to get in the you know which is very diff, which is a very difficult ask to begin with and then in the future as we see the maturity of krsi and or bpf lsm as we call it now uh, uh things will get even more complicated uh, uh, even though it will even though there is a possibility of things getting more flexible or the the policy enforcement becoming more flexible it will also become more complicated there needs to be an engine which can hide this complexity from the user and that's where a cube armor comes into picture so the demo scenario again i'm not going to actually give the demo but what we have is we have a video of this demo scenario where we have a wordpress and mysql application uh, it is possible to audit all access in, in a particular path of course falco and tracy can also do that uh, we we can also block any credential access by unknown processes to this particular wordpress configuration file so we can say that apart from wordpress config uh, or wordpress processes no other process should be able to cat or open this particular file uh, we can block doing that completely we can we can block the access of kubernetes api server outside of certain processes and we can block the execution of specific processes so within a container we can say that apart from this uh, this uh, uh, this set of allowed uh, processes no other process should be able to execute so all all, the, all this is part of the demo uh, which we have uh, which i have a separate video for this is how the demo policies look like uh, for the uh, for, for the demo scenarios that I've mentioned. You can see, you know, and it's it's uh, if you go to the GitHub page of Cube Armor, you'll see the detailed policy specification. Uh, uh, but essentially, the block action is what gives Cube Armor its all, all its powers. Now, one thing to note here is that Cube Armor also has alerting engine, which means that not only can it block things, but it can also audit things. Uh, so it is it is uh, it is an alerting engine with 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 additionally policy enforcement as well built in uh, again I, I just wanted to you know one of the challenges that we felt was that you know it's extremely difficult to for anyone to come up with a set of uh, systems policy build a set of systems policy uh, so one thing that we are also developing is a common discovery policy discovery engine, which is not only for cube armor, uh, but it, which can also auto discover systems policy, it can auto discover network policy and in the hope in the future, hopefully, even the data policies. Uh, what we are trying to do here is we are taking all the feeds that are available from Celium, Calico, CNIs, uh, cube armor and matching it with the metadata from Kubernetes client. And we are building uh, we are building a generic policy output. This generous, generic policy output can be converted into CubeArmor system policy. It could as well be converted into Falco policy. Uh, it can be converted into Calico network policy or Celium network policy, depending upon what the uh, policy type is. So the, the aim is to, you know, discovering least permissive policy set is, you know, it's, it's, it's much easier said than done. It's, it's, it's extremely difficult to get it right. 
The next steps. Yes, sir, uh, Rahul. Sorry, yeah. just a quick question on that last point. So I understand it correctly. So is the idea that um, when you say to detect things like Calico network policy, so network policies I get because they're fairly standard, although there are some extensions that Calico and Cilium put on top of them. But other policies, like with um, if there's Falco rules and things like that configured, would all those also be considered detected, or those are outside of the scope here? No, no, it's not outside of the scope. So let me give an example. So uh, Cilium and Calico they expose all sorts of all sorts of rich network telemetry feeds based on which the network policy can be can be identified, right, or discovered, so to speak. Cube Armor has a mode called a visibility mode in which it will it will uh, it, it makes sure that it imposes least control overhead by making use of eBPF uh, mechanism, but it checks for file file accesses, process spawning events, capability accesses uh, uh, events uh, such as these, and then all this is sent as system logs to the policy discovery module, which in turn generates a generic system policy. Uh, I'm calling it NOC system policy, but it's it's a, it's a it's a generic language. And then from this, we can we can have either Falco or Cube Armor system policy. The, but, but the prompt point is Cube Armor something supports something called as visibility mode, which makes it possible. Okay. So, but what if and we have like some existing Falco rules configured? Let's say we want to prevent SSH, so that is already running on the system. Would that also be detected, and then could that be enforced through no, so, the, so, so the existing rules from Falco, we, we are not touching. We are, we are not even going there. So, what we are seeing is, you know, uh, through visibility, what we see that these are the possible accesses, and then you you come up with a set of. Uh, so, the example that you gave is with Falco. If someone does an SSH, send an alert. So, those policies remain as it is. Uh, those won't be impacted. So it doesn't mean here that the discovered policy set is the only policy set which is allowed. You might have, even in case of network policies, you might already have existing policies in picture in place, uh, which, which, which of course uh, continue as it is. Okay. But yeah, I if I understand you, oh, sorry, go ahead. Please go first. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, this is Jaya. Um, I think uh, Rahul, I think my question was, um, how does this relate to Falco? Meaning there's already a Falco community, et cetera. So is this uh, another community? Uh, and, yes. and then so, the question is, you know, how do the, yeah, go ahead. So, so the first question is how, the, how does this relate to Falco, right? Uh, Falco today is an alerting engine. Right, it doesn't do any enforcement, uh, so it uses eBPF constructs so that you know the least amount of control overhead can be added. Uh, you know, you can do the alerting with the least amount of control overhead. But but it's it's an alerting engine. With Cube Armor, what we are trying to do additionally is enforcement as well. Uh, so what I meant here was that you know you have Falco and Tracy uh, in the kernel space, the eBPF power modules of uh, Falco and Tracy in the kernel space, they can send an alert. So Falco and Tracy, they use K probes, uh, other eBPF hook points, which cannot do enforcement. They can mm -hmm. look into the metadata, but they cannot do enforcement. The only place where you can possibly do any enforcement in kernel space is LSM hooks. Uh, what Cube Armor is doing is it, 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 it does both. One is it has auditing engine as well, because auditing engine is required anyways. Uh, we don't expect uh, administrators to directly go and you know enforce rules, block or deny based rules directly. So auditing engine is required anyway. So but but Falco is only about auditing engine. Cube Armor is trying to do both. Okay, so then my question is, uh, do I deploy both or do I just deploy Cube Armor and uh, that that takes care of both? Yeah, that that's a good question. That's an uh, so so we, we internally you know uh, thought as to what we should be doing about this. Uh, shall we be using Falco as it is as an auditing engine, or shall we be shall shall we be restricting Cube Armor as it is for enforcement just for the enforcement purpose? But eventually we found certain use cases which requires that you know certain rich auditing to be in place. For example, rate based control. Is it possible to do in kernel rate based control? Like if, if someone tries to do a write 
at the rate of 1000 writes per second or connect at the rate of 10 connects per second, such kind of rules. So what I'm trying to say is uh, Cube Armor is trying to do both today, auditing as well as enforcement. And the reason why we had to do both was because there are certain use cases in the context of uh, MITRE defense frameworks, which were not fulfilled by existing engines. And we saw, we, we thought that that would be best to be achieved with a complete redesign. And that's where, that's where we are going with this. Okay. So there's, and, and then this chart, just to make sure again, I clarify my understanding. So there are two, seems like there's two important distinctions. One is that with your, on the left, you're showing that tools like Falco and Tracy would require some enforcement, some separate tool for enforcement in user space. And that's not part of the open source toolkits. Um, and I think the second one is to have to move, well, the second one I also mentioned, which is to move that enforcement into kernel space itself. So it's not an asynchronous process. I think so that, that's the key part. Cause if it, I mean, from, from experience, if it's in user space, it's, it's basically not an enforcement mechanism. Okay. Easily work it's around. more reactive. Yeah. Right. It, it's just fundamentally not doing anything. It can be easily hooked and, and redirected. That's right. If, if, if there is a malicious process which is trying to delete a file, the file is already deleted till the time the process is to be killed. That's an example, right? So uh, without inline control, you cannot uh, cannot handle certain enforcement rules in the existence. Yeah, so then my follow-up question is then, why wouldn't this work also be contributed to Falco rather than creating it another? Because one of the things, you know, when we look at uh, the area of focus that I am focused on, uh, as well as Gus from my team who is on SCAL, is multi-cluster governance, right? And uh, security and compliance. And then, you know, and we are looking at, okay, what are all the various controls we have to put in place? What are all the various enforcement points we have to put in place, right? And um, it seems like uh, we are adding more and more of different kinds of things. So my question is, if Falco is doing a piece and okay, Falco doesn't do enforcement, why wouldn't we contribute this to the Falco community? Why are we creating another one? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. And we, we have given it a substantial thought before starting working on a separate uh, you know, project altogether. The reason, one, one good reason that I mentioned, you know, even within alerting, uh, we found that the fundamental design of Falco and Tracy doesn't allow us to do certain things. If we have to make those changes, it's going to basically change the way the fundamental structures, the way in which the EBPF modules work. Uh, it's going to create a lot of change. Uh, so, so uh, again, Rahul, can you please give an example? Yeah, the an example would be uh, like a rate-based control. Let's say, for example, uh, I want to put in a uh, in a rule which says that I I want to allow anything about ten connects per second from this particular container is a problem. If you have to apply such kind of rules and this kind of rules are best applied in kernel space, uh, because if you're sending a syscall event to user space, it's going to have an extreme overhead. Uh, so, so uh, you know, such kind of things, uh, we thought that it would be best to, uh, does it make sense, uh, uh, Anushka? Sorry, if, uh, was, was, was it a question from Anushka, sir? No, it was Anka. That, that's fine. Oh, sorry, sorry, Anka. Yeah. No, no problem. I will. I will note that you know I use Falco, have used Falco, um, but Falco is really kind of a thin layer on top of the Sysdig engine, so it's kind of a bolt-on. So I think the 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 legacy of having that early days prior to Kubernetes is you know that yes, it has a big community, but it was it was purpose built for a different purpose, I think. Uh, at least that's from my perspective. Again, having used it, the, the other feature that I liked is this notion of kind of a simplified policy language, trying to map um, Falco rules to your frameworks and the specific policy goals is is a bit tedious. Doable, but, but tedious. Yeah, if you go back to your examples, Rahul, I think those are good to show again for policies because yeah, they're very simple declarative policies, which, you know, again, makes a lot of sense for a Kubernetes admin, right? Yeah. 
yeah, so some interesting trade-offs um, for sure. That, that's a good point, Jim, because I mean, having having had the, that conversation with Kubernetes admin, they're just like, right. well, can I just yeah. can I just throw this Falco rules to you and you figure it out? <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, that's the challenge, right? And then you come up with vendor controlled libraries and things like that versus something an admin's comfortable customizing. And, and we had that same experience at Kiverno and OPA, right? So we've gone through this uh, discussion. Uh, one point here, uh, <clears throat> we, we found that even this is, this, this is easy to understand, but coming up with this kind of rule set is it's still sure. difficult, you know, uh, and that, that that's why we thought that giving we, we have to give a serious thoughts towards auto discovering such policies, enabling something called as visibility mode, which uh, visibility mode allows us to see a wide variety of events with least control overhead. We, we, we make sure that right. We, uh, so. so one other kind of question, you know, one of the things you mentioned earlier, like in the presentation, was that. LSMs are difficult to configure today and you know there's differences in those so are there standard set of policies that you have uh, that the team is building which translates some of those into things that kubernetes admin can understand and manage yes so uh, there the are two points here one is you know uh, so the standard policies uh, the the good news here is that with SE linux there are already a lot of standard policies that are built but those are built primarily from the host perspective, okay. not from from the workload perspective, not from the containers, individual containers perspective. So, uh, you know, even for individual containers perspective, like Apache and NGINX, there are there are SLNX policies, but those Apaches uh, or NGINX are, are are supposed to be executed directly on the host. They are not supposed to be containerized. So so and a lot of things change when you try to use this LSNs in the context of containerized workloads. Uh, so, yes, uh, my answer would be, to some extent, we can reuse those policies already defined by SLNX, but the other approach that we are looking at is, we are trying to look at STIGs, which define workload specific policies already, uh, rules, and we are trying to convert those into CubeArmor uh, policies, not CubeArmor, actually it's generic policies, uh, and then make sure that, you know, uh, those policies can in turn be exported to either CubeArmor or Falcon. Okay, so if I recall correctly, in the pod security standards, um, the 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 you know recommendation for SE Linux and App Armor is okay. Don't change the defaults. Whatever is configured on the host, you're gonna you, you're not allowed to change that if you're running in you know restricted mode, right? Um, right? But here, what you're saying is okay for certain workloads. I I need that flexibility, so it's better to control it on a per workload basis versus on a shared host. Yeah, that completely makes sense because you know I think the previous model was hosts were dedicated to applications, which is no longer the case. Um, okay. Uh, one other quick thought and you know this could be a future discussion is any any kind of uh, intersection with multi-tenancy because there's always a lot of discussion about you know namespace as well as virtual cluster based multi-tenancy and isolating workloads. There's of course, you know, um, sandboxing at the container level, but anything that you can, you know, or has there been any discussion about how to enforce or audit certain levels of multi-tenancy using Kubearmor? So if you see the Kubearmor policies, already they are at the namespace level. Uh, you know, you, you can have either a host-based policy or a, or a policy which is at a particular namespace only applied for a particular set of labels you know so so that flexibility with that does the will that be good enough for multi-tenancy or are there any more problem statements that, you know? yeah so here this would allow each tenant workload to have its own policies but what i'm thinking about is from the cluster admin point of view to enforce certain multi-tenancy constraints right so it's the outside in view not the per tenant view Hmm. I, I don't think we have given enough thoughts towards this, uh, Jim. Okay. Uh, this is certainly interesting, yeah. Yeah, love we should discuss. And there's also the multi-tenancy working group, which I, you know, I'm a part of, and that there would be some interesting conversations potentially to be had there. Yeah, I think that's I think that's gonna be table stakes for, for broad adoption. I think you'll get early adoption without it. But yeah, Jim, to your point, I think that's the, the cluster operators are gonna oh. want. <clears throat> 
So Rahul, um, just so I I know I got it right, right? So it seems like we can use this to uh, provide um, or or discover Falco rules and map them into more declarative policies, and then we can also update those policies and get them um, get it to update the underlying Falco rules. Um, and make sure it's in place. Did I get that all right? Well, uh, that's that's a statement I would make in the context of this slide. But this this particular work item, you know, it's it's I would say this is a highly decoupled work item. In fact, this could be a completely different work, uh, even though we are managing it as part of Cube today. But this discovering a policy set in which you know once the discovered policies could be mapped eventually to Falco rules, Tracy rules, or Tracy or or uh, Cube Armor rules. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, what you said is right, but that's one aspect of the work. Yes, I was I was going to ask that. I mean, it almost seems like this could be its own project. Yes, um, and, and maybe folks here on this call want to want to participate, myself included. That uh, I, I could see this having value outside of just cube armor, um, but you know, certainly you guys could be. Yeah, back. I agree with you, Robert, because. Uh, the way I think about that is almost like how Gatekeeper bridged uh, Operego to Kubernetes, right? It allowed you to specify Operego policies using Kubernetes constraints, which then uh, from our open cluster management project, which provides that multi-cluster capability, we were able to then uh, apply that across multiple clusters, right? So if this gives me the ability to represent Falco rules as Kubernetes CRs, I think that will be powerful. So my question, Rahul, is that already there or is, is that what this is? This is more a vision, this is what you want to accomplish. Oh, well, uh, well, this is, uh, the visibility mode in Cube Armor is already there, but this overall engine we haven't open sourced as yet. Uh, uh, but we, we intend to open source this whole engine. We, we already have systems policy discovery and uh, networks policy discovery, but the data policy discovery is also something that we wanted to build in this, uh, but, but that could be a future to do just with the network policy discovery and system policy discovery. It could be powerful enough, you know, uh, still there are rules, you know, multi-cluster handling is still pending, you know, uh, remaining in this, but, uh, so to speak, you know, this is not already there in the open source, but this is something that is getting built towards. Okay. Yeah, and, and just okay. to clarify, yeah, I think what... yeah. sorry, go, go ahead, ahead Jeff. No, 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 what I was saying is, uh, I think the multi-cluster capability is something we have in our open cluster management project, right? So we have a built-in country policy controller that can deploy, uh, capabilities on to manage clusters and also can make sure it's configured, et cetera, as long as it's all represented as Kubernetes CRs, right? So, so I was thinking if Kubeomer allows me to specify Falco rules using Kubernetes as Kubernetes CRs, I think that'll be very interesting for us. So yeah, just one thought there, Jaya and uh, Rahul, correct me if I misunderstand or misstate something. I think I think the goal there, and, and this is why I started looking at Cube Armor, is so Falco because of its the limitations that you know Rahul can has explained and can go into much deeper ways. It's not going to work for highly regulated environments that have really really stringent requirements on user space versus kernel, synchronous inline versus async. So I'd say. You probably want to look at if if Kubernetes, which itself has operator support built in, like you don't have to have a gatekeeper because that was a, a stovepipe exercise because it wasn't natively Kubernetes. If Kubernetes is natively Kubernetes, correct me if I'm wrong, then then you get that out of the box and you don't have to create Falco rules via this tool, you just write the Kubarma rules and you get a better technical solution, i.e. one that's gonna pass muster in the regulated environments and meet those really strict uh, kernel space control requirements. So I would think uh, it's Falco. I, Falco is kind of a nice, a light version of uh, enforcement and Kubarma is a really robust version of enforcement that is Kubernetes native. 
So are you saying, Robert, that uh, with Q bomber, I don't need Falco? Meaning Falco doesn't give me anything more? That I'll punt back to a hole because I, <laughs> I, yes. I, I am looking at it as a replacement myself. Yeah. I haven't made that. Yes. Decision. Yes, Jaya. And it, it, that, that is what uh, you know, uh, we think eventually will happen. Uh, I don't think we have okay. all, the, all, the, all the flexibility of Falco today. Uh, but yeah, eventually those have to be, you know, it's, it's, uh, those, uh, those, have, those have to be built in, is what I see. Right. And that's the clarification okay. I was going to make, because the way I'm looking at this picture, you potentially could have Falco rules on the left, but what comes out on the right would then would be tra a translation to a Kubarmer policy natively, right? But when you what you're deploying on your clusters is no longer than Falco rules, and there's no need to la wrap a Falco rule into a CR for that, right? Because you not you don't necessarily need to run Falco if you're running Kubarmer. At least that was my understanding, and of course there's a lot more details there, and there's probably a lot of other trade-offs to consider. But at a high level, that's one interpretation of this picture. So let let me you know uh, you know. Uh, describe one 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 uh, one thing that you know. So when we're working on the MITRE defense uh, framework, MITRE attack framework, you know, finding out the defense uh, rules. In most of the defense rules, uh, we found that there was a need for correlating events which were temporally situated. You know, uh, we had to apply a rate limit based factors so as to reduce the number of false positives. We were trying to check if it is possible to do this with Tracy or Falco, and we found that you know. It, it, it would be difficult, uh, uh, you know, and, th and that's where, you know, a lot of things changed for us, you know, that's where uh, we, we went into this. And in case of MITRE, they also specify in what, what all things have to be blocked. So it's not only about alerting, uh, they also specify that there is no reason why a processor should access this or delete this particular file. Uh, uh, so it, it's best to have a block based policy, you know. Uh, so, so with all this in mind, you know, that was the design rationale. Rahul, if you could go to your last slide, I had some questions on the roadmap and next steps. You had some interesting points there. So in terms of the project itself, right now, this is an open source project. This is, what's the license that it's, it's open source with? It's Apache 2, uh, yeah. Okay, that's great. And are there plans to, I mean, what do you, from the open source community point of view, are there plans to kind of, uh, you know, at some point make this part of CNCF or, or if it's something that hasn't been discussed, that's fine too, but just curious. Yes, uh, we certainly would like to, you know, uh, bring this to CNCF uh, and that's where you do the first step of becoming a CNCF member. I cannot stop that first step of becoming a CNCF uh, member. Uh, we are we are hoping in eventually. So our priority today is to make sure that the LSM engine which Cubarma uses is robust enough. Uh, we could have few, few deployments, you know, uh, based on that uh, policy engine. Uh, uh, the policy constructs would be expanded uh, while this happens. Uh, so, so that is what our focus is uh, today. If you, if you ask me, KRSI is one of the key key thing with KRSI. The way I think about KRSI is the way eBPF changed, you know, the net filter was in a way obsoleted by eBPF based policy controls today for network policy enforcement. I see the same thing happening in the context of LSM. The SE Linux and App Armor, they will be applied at the host level. But if you want specific, a certain specific right. rule, you use BPF LSM or KRSI for that particular rule. You don't, you don't hassle with the foundational SE Linux rules. Agreed. Yeah, and there's some very interesting developments also happening in the operating system world, because once you kind of move more to a container OS model, SE Linux and other things start making less sense, right? So, yep. yeah, very cool. Thank you. I know uh, we only have 15 minutes left, but this is awesome. Also happy to see, you know, the, the PR that you've listed or the issue report, I should say. Mm -hmm. We don't have a PR yet, but... Uh, let, let us know how we can help with you know the policy report mapping or any other thoughts or ideas on you know potential collaboration with uh, efforts with the work group.
Surely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all the feedback. Thank you. Thanks, Rahul. Thanks, Rahul. All right. I know we had a few other agenda items listed. Let me bring up the worksheet again. Um, or the, I guess, the meeting. Yeah, I think white okay. paper update was was first. Yeah, Jaya, I saw your PRs. Thank you. And Robert, I saw you've already added it's a few comments. So let we can continue those discussions. Um, and there's also, you know, the, there's a few other sections. I know Aradna, you had mentioned you were interested in contributing to a few sections. Um, and there's others which you know I was gonna self-assign a couple this week. So we can continue to make progress. Robert, you had asked about timelines. I, I did not specify any dates, but maybe it's a good idea uh, if everyone has a sense for the effort involved, maybe we can work offline and come up with like a quick rough date to align on and where we might be complete with the different sections. Okay, I, yeah, I don't remember asking the question, but it sounds like a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Jaya, Radna, does that sound good? And Anka, I think the, all three of you had you know, kind of volunteered for sections and uh, I'll take yeah. uh, a few that's left. Should we plan yeah, for I think like that's roughly? The... Sounds like yeah, a plan. timeline sounds awesome. Okay. Yeah, maybe sure. we can discuss in Slack, but uh, I'm hoping okay. we can get this out uh, sometime in July. Yeah, so if we maybe plan a first draft by let's say the 25th roughly with us with that. So that gives us about two weeks to complete a draft and then we start uh, circulating with others. But, yeah, yeah. I, I think that might be aggressive. Um, I don't know, I've got a few <laughs> deadlines, but yeah, it's a good line yeah. in the sand to start with. <laughs> All right, uh, so yeah, maybe if we want some more time, if not the 20, so maybe the ninth, that would give us four weeks. That's, let's let's discuss offline and we can collect some thoughts and just get, uh, get some timeline in place. All right, um, I think so, then Robert, you had this topic. Yeah, I, I think I added this, but I think given the time and uh, you know the the depth of this issue, I, should we just table this till the next call and then maybe uh, actually reach out to the Kubernetes group that is working on uh, bill materials, S bomb stuff, and maybe have a presentation from them? Um, that would be with, awesome. Yeah, we're not going to cover it in sufficient detail right. in the last ten minutes. Okay. Okay. I'll move back. Right. Yeah, also saw the announcement I posted. I saw something on LinkedIn as well on OSCAL. So um, it would be interesting maybe in, again in an upcoming meeting if Anka or Robert, if you want to uh, sort of give an output or update on if it, things have changed in OSCAL 1.0 or any interesting highlights from that. Sure, yes. My, minor minor changes, but we, we are glad okay. to see the stick in the ground type of thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the I think the the big uh, event is that it's out there one zero, and so now I think the momentum will be for folks to adopt it and start using it. Exactly. And so I think if we can be thought leaders there and, and early adopters, then I think that's great for the community. We had a big list of eight things to be to be changed. So we have four included in this release one and. The other four planned for the October release, so we can we can go over them and. All right, okay, and then yeah, I think the other items we had and um, you know as a quick demo of the Coop Bench adapter by Merton J, who has completed his you know spring mentorship, and then we can quickly just cover status from Anushka as well as. Um, you know, on, on Sanushka will cover the Falco, and then Stephen can cover, you know, what we're doing um, for evaluating um, image scanners in terms of uh, mapping those to the CR as well. I know we only have a nine minutes left. Mertenjaya, do you have yeah. time for yeah, a yeah. demo right now, or should we schedule in the next session? 
I think um, at the demo may take just a couple of minutes. So if uh, if uh, okay. I can I can do that. Uh, the screen share is working. So uh, just sharing the screen. Thank you so much to the to everyone and to the entire community for uh, 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 allowing me to for for helping me to complete this project so uh, amazingly. And now I'm going to share the screen. I hope my the screen is visible and my terminal is visible. Yes, we can so, see. So yeah. So I have already created the cluster. Now what I'm going to do, uh, let me just show you the steps that we follow. So what is KubeBench adapter? So the, the KubeBench adapter will run the CIS benchmark checks by uh, KubeBench, which is a tool, uh, and it will run it as a job. A job is then that job will run inside of, inside our binary itself. So we don't need to worry about that. And it will map it with our policy report custom resource definition and create the policy report object. So uh, I have already created the cluster. The next thing that I will do, I will create uh, the custom resource definition by following this step and just a moment. So after this, as we can see the policy, the custom resource definition is created. Now we will allow uh, the role binding and services and roles so that our jobs can be accessed. Uh, so after that, we do that. That is also done. The RBAC is authorization done. Now we are going to create the cron job. So what does that cron job will do? This cron job will run, will create the KubeBench adapter uh, job pods running, and they will get, they will create the policy report that we needed on its own. And they, uh, right now I have fixed the schedule for one hour. So uh, we will just have one policy report created for now. And after every hour, there will be a new policy report created. So I am creating this using the command cubital create dash f kubernetes cron job dot yml. Now, if we will use cubital get jobs watch, we will see the jobs running. And uh, in another terminal, I will show how the policy report has been created. So it will just take a few minutes to run. It's taking a little time because I guess Zoom and a little bit Slack and everything is open. I'm closing the Slack. So that was a previous policy report. Maybe you could just show that for now, Martin J. No, actually, uh, I'm showing the live demo itself. So it's taking some time to create the job. I don't know why right now it's, it's because it's mainly because I guess the speed has, the processes are running on Zoom as well as VS code is open. So maybe that may be the reason, but that's why it is showing no resources found in default names for resource. Let me let's see, is it running or not? Okay jobs so what will happen after that you will get from job so it's, it's scheduled but it's not uh, showing as of now but what will happen after that that, that this cron job will run this cron job will pull our uh, policy report and uh, policy report docker image and it will run the job inside that and will fetch the cube bench outputs and after fetching those cube bench output it will map with our custom resource definition and create a policy report so what i can do rather than uh, running it inside cron job i can also build it using the binary so just using this binary policy report it will get created hopefully let's see yeah so now this is what is happening right now if, if it is uh, visible this is an internal job that is running running that that was cube bench job and as we see the policy report is created so this is our policy report that has been created, uh, creating policy report. And this policy report is known by the name Cubebench. Uh, so if we check now, Cubectel get policy reports. Cubectel, sorry. So we can see that we are getting uh, 70 passes, 11 pill, 38 warnings. And if we want it in the form of uh, uh, YAML file, uh, what we can do is just we can use cubic to get policy reports by ML in the form of a particular file. 
like rest.pyml. So we can use that Q vector command. And now our pyml will be present here as rest.pyml. So if we see, so this is our policy report that that's created. So this is our policy report uh, that has been created by this uh, program, by this adapter. So that, that policy report is basically created based on the mappings of the custom resource definition. So that is how it looks. And the cron job is also running at the back end. Hopefully, if I am able to show it, I guess it should run now. Uh, so, so still isn't showing, but it, it is running in the background. And uh, what will happen, this cron job will automatically create the policy report on its own after every hour and it will update it with uh, whatever and it's not it, it will not only create the policy report it will also update the policy report on its own if 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 the policy report's name is same like here the name is cube bench and if the another policy report that is being created is with the same name it would be it will be updated with the latest plot with the latest one so that was a project it will uh, soon be pushed in the official repository i've already created the pull request and is being reviewed by jim and after a few more reviews it will hopefully be the part of our working group policy report i'm sharing the link so that uh, uh, you can definitely try this project and uh, share the feedback i would love to have all the feedback i'm so sorry that the, maybe the processes are uh, so many processes that I cannot show the cron job thing, but I have run that thing, same thing using the binary itself. So uh, that was my demo. Thank you so much. No worries. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Martin Thank Jay. Thank um, so all right. So maybe I know we just have a couple of minutes left. So Stephen and Anushka, if you want to just quickly give updates. Um, I don't have any demo yet to show for my. Um, which will be coming up next next meeting. But well, basically, I'm working on um, image vulnerability scanner for for for, 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 for Kubernetes. So I'll be using Trivi. Um, basically, we are meant to compare between Trivi and Claire. So um, Claire um, um, has to be run on what is it called um, major services. Why Trivi, you know, can be done locally for us to create a policy resource group for that. So I think um, we'll be doing that because um, this week was actually for the comparison. So more on the development to be coming as from next week. So I think that's, that's what we're doing. And also um, um, the teams from from Aqua, they actually say, because um, um, they, they brought this app, this project um, called um, Starboard. So Starboard basically is like a toolkit for, for, for for CRG for custom resource, um, which doesn't have the policy for 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 the policy and custom resource, that uh, are actually building for for our image for our image scanner. So they are actually thinking of you know building something like that, working on their starboard to build a policy resource um, definition for their for their starboard. So that's that, and I've checked on on the starboard. I've not actually tested it locally on myself, but. I've checked on it. It's a nice project, by the way, um, which has is not just really vulnerability. It also has um, what is it called reports from some other stuff. I'm going to share the link um, right here. Um, so basically, that's just it. Um, I don't have any demo to show here for for my test of Trivi locally and you know and Clever to be coming up. It will be coming up next next meeting. So that's just what I want to okay. update. Thank you, Stephen. You're welcome. Hi everyone, I'll make this quick. So hi, I'm Anishka Mittal. I am LFX Summer Menti working with Jim on issue 51 that uh, looks into building a Falco adapter that will take output from Falco and uh, well map it with uh, a policy report CRD and generate a policy report. So the, up, uh, the update, uh, the things that I have been working on is mapping the first draft. I have, uh, got a first draft that, that I have shared in the meeting uh, meeting doc. It uh, it has been reviewed once. I think we are still stuck in the summary part of it where we want to look into in-depth, uh, where we want to look into uh, Falco conditions, the uh, conditions key in rules that will help us map it better, increment fail counter every time there's an alert. 
Secondly, we are discussing an approach to capture data from Palco. Uh, the two things that we are looking into are gRPC server and Palco Psychic. Initially, I was under the impression that Palco's uh, gRPC server would be better given that it's in, in Palco and it just has to be externally enabled for it to work and give a good output. But I have come to like Falco Psychic. The two trade offs that we have considered as of now are plus one for Falco Psychic, given that uh, you can run it on uh, just one minute. Yes, uh, that you can run it, run it in Docker container using jobs, which will make it easy for us to use and work with in the future. Uh, minus one for gRPC would be its. Uh, issue that I came across on GitHub uh, concerning its high CPU usage when it's enabled. Otherwise, uh, we further plan to work on uh, studying the code, understanding how a future code will look and finalizing an, uh, an approach to find, uh, capture the data and finally start preparing a prototype of the code and maybe show something next meeting. And just one more thing since Gus is on this call, I would really like to know if I can discuss with you, have a dialogue with you over mapping. Since most of my initial uh, mapping work was done using the PR that you had created. That's all. Thank you so much, you guys. Sure, that, that sounds good too. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Anushka. It's really awesome to really awesome to see all this policy report work becoming real. So thank you all. It's excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank this you so much stuff. Yeah. Okay, I know we're a little bit over time, but uh, any any closing thoughts or anything else from anyone? All right, that sounds like a no. So thanks everyone and see you next time. Thanks everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you so much.